Um, as you know, we're continuing our series on Romans. We, the last time we all got together, we were doing Romans chapter 1 through Romans chapter 8. And each week, if you're new here, each week um, we'll have somebody else that will be speaking. Um, I normally will be, um, I start the series and sometimes I even close the series, but in the in-between time we have men in our in our ministry that are teachers and communicators and and um, we want to use their skill sets as well and so they will be coming up and they'll be talking about each chapter what you need to know is we're not going to do an exhaustive breakdown of each chapter we don't have that much time so what we do is is i've told everybody look you're going to look at the chapter as a whole and then try to find like one nugget that you want to share in that chapter, because we can spend years just going through all of Romans, which I have as a senior pastor. I, I preached through Romans in over a year one time. But um, for this purposes, what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to go through, read Romans to you, but then I'm going to come back and highlight a certain area. But here's what I got to tell you about tonight. This is kind of the little like warning on it. Um, I teach a class called membership and in membership, I talk about what is called non-essentials to the faith versus essentials to the faith, okay? A non-essential to the faith is if we wanna debate on speaking in tongues, if we wanna debate on pre-trib, post-trib, mid-trib, all male, if you wanna debate on these kind of things, great, let's have debates, but they're non-essentials to the faith, meaning this, if we can't agree on who Jesus Christ is, if we can't agree on where salvation lies, now we're going to have some issues that's considered essentials to the faith, okay? And so tonight, I'm going to be talking on, on a subject that really the contrast is this. You have Arminians on one side, and Arminian view is that, that they believe that you have a free will, and with that free will, you can choose to follow Christ, and then you can choose to walk away from Christ. And then you can choose to follow him again and walk away. It's called a free will, and you would have that free will to do whatever you want. Okay, so that's the extreme on one end. The other extreme is what is called a Calvinist. A Calvinist is a person that believes that you were elected and you have no choice in the matter. You were chosen before time. You were chosen at the very beginning. And some of us were chosen to go to heaven and some were not. Okay. And that is called election. And so that's the other extreme. Well, one of the proof texts that a Calvinist will use is Romans chapter 9. And so that's what I'm going to get in tonight. And I'm going to try to challenge you. And here's the thing. You could agree to disagree with me and you can still come back, okay? Uh, I'll let you in the doors. Um, so this is a non-essential of the faith, but it is something that we should all wrestle with and try to figure out for ourselves on it. And I am happy to have discussions afterwards, not late tonight afterwards, but afterwards, if you wanna have discussions more, I'm happy to do so. If you wanna point out that I'm wrong in an area, I'm happy to do so. Um, but this is something that I've wrestled through and I wanna share that with you tonight and challenge you with that, all right? All right, so let me open up a word of prayer and we'll get started. God, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity I have to again, share from your word and to share um, um, a little bit of understanding of this issue of election in our lives. And so, Lord, bless this time that I have in your son's name. Amen. Amen. First off, the overview of the book of Romans. We all know that Romans was written by Paul. Okay. Paul is the author of this. And this is during a time when um, the, the Jews were not, the Christians, I should say, were not being persecuted, okay? This is the time that Nero came into power for Rome, but Nero had yet to start persecuting the Christians. Matter of fact, Nero didn't start persecuting the Christians until the great fire happened in Rome, and Nero blames the Christians for the fire, which turns the country against all Christians, and then that's when the persecution happened. So this letter is written prior to that happening, okay? And he's writing it to the church as a whole because they have Gentiles that are in this church, and then they have Jews that are in this church, okay? And he's trying to explain to them in this whole letter of understanding the relationships of, of the Jews and the Gentiles and where, where um, God is when it comes to a Gentile and trying to explain that to even a Jew. And you'll see some of that play out 
when I read Romans chapter 9. But so you have the first few chapters. Chapters 1 through 3 shows, um, Paul shows how human beings lack God's righteousness because of our sin. And so you will see that, that Paul starts off in Romans 1. He talks about how uh, man is deprived, that a man it has this sinful nature. And you'll see that God gives them over to their depraved mind. It says that he gives them over to this wrath in their life. And if you look at verse 24 of chapter 1, you'll see that their wrath is this uh, detestable practices that they do. And they exchange natural relations for, um, they exchange unnatural relations with each other versus natural relations. And it goes into the description of that. And so he paints this overall picture of saying, let me tell you how horrible everybody is. And then he comes back in, in chapters 4 through 5, and he says, we receive God's righteousness when God justifies us by faith. Salvation happens through justification. It's where we are justified that we are now found righteous in God's eyes, and that only happens through a relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came, died on the cross, cleanses us, and that is when we are justified with God, and we're seen as righteous, okay? And so he talks about those in those chapters. Then going on, chapter 6 through 8, God's righteousness is now demonstrated by transforming rebels into followers. Here's where he starts to describe and, and for us to understand that there's a transformation that happens in all of our lives. When we surrender our lives to the Lord, we're now living our lives for Him. And we actually look different, we act different, we talk different. It's, it's when somebody looks at you at work and goes, are you a believer? Right? It's, it's that person that you bump into and, and you're talking to them and they find out there's something different about you. It's because you've been transformed. It's the reason why we have baptism, because it's an outward symbol of this transformation, saying that we die to our old selves and we're being raised again into a new life. That's that transformation that happens in our life. And then you look at chapters 9 through 11, which I'm going to talk on tonight, that verifies his righteousness through sovereignty. And I'll explain God's sovereignty a little bit. And then lastly, you have chapters 12 through 16. God applies his righteousness in practical ways throughout our lives. So now we get to Romans chapter 9. If you have your Bibles, you want to turn over there. I had a guy that asked me uh, on Wednesday, um, what book are you using? And I said, well, I'm using the Bible. Um, but what he meant was what version of the Bible. I'm, I'm going to be reading out of the NIV if you want to know. So if you have that Bible app and you want to click it over to the NIV, you can do so. Um, I'm going to start in verse 1. I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it through the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. Um, for I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my people, those of my own race, the people of Israel. Theirs is the adoption to sonship. Theirs is the divine glory, the covenant, the receiving of the law, the temple worship, the promise. Theirs are the patriarchs, and, and from them is the trace, the human's ancestry of the Messiah, who is God over all forever praised. Amen. Verse 6, it is not as though God's word had failed, for not all who were descendants from Israel are Israel, nor because they are his descendants are they all Abraham's children. On the contrary, it is though Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. In other words, it is not the children by physical descent who are God's children, but is the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. For this was... For this was how this promise was stated. At the appointed time, I will return, and Sarah will have a son. Not only that, but Rebekah's children were conceived at the same time by our father Isaac. Yet before the twins were born or had done anything good or bad, in order that God's purpose in election might stand, not by works, but by him who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger. Just as it is written, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. What then shall we say? Is God unjust? Not at all. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. It does not therefore depend on human desire or effort, but on God's mercy. 
For scripture says to Pharaoh, I raise you up for this very purpose, that I might display my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Therefore, God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy, and he hardens who he wants to harden. One of you will say to me, then why does God still blame us? For who is able to re resist his will? But who are you, a human being, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, why did you make me like this? Does not the potter have the right to make out of some lump of clay some pottery for special purpose and some for common use? What if God, although choosing to show his wrath and make his power known, bore with great patience the object of his wrath prepared for destruction? What if he did this to make the riches of his glory known to the objects of his mercy, whom he prepared in advance for glory, even us whom he also called, not only from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles? As he says to Hosea, I will call them my people who are not my people, and I will call her my loved ones who is not my loved ones. And in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they will be called children of the living God. Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the Israelites be like the sand of the sea, only the remnant will be saved. For the Lord will carry out his sentence on earth with speed and finality. It is just as Isaiah said previously, unless the Lord Almighty had left us descendants, we would have become like Sodom. We would have become like Gomorrah. What then shall we say? That the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have obtained it? a righteousness that is by faith, but the people of Israel who pursue, pursued the law as the way of righteousness have not attained their goal? Why not? Because they pursued it not by faith, but it was by their works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone as it is written, as it is written, see, I lay a Zion, a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. And the one who believes in him will never be put to shame. Ooh, that's a lot. Okay. So I'm not going to be able to get through all of Romans 9. But here's what I want to talk about. First thing we need to understand, anytime you're doing anything with biblical interpretation, when you're going to interpret the, t the Bible, context, 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 context is key. So... If you have a class and they ask you, what's the first thing you need to take a look at when you're interpreting? If you write the word context, you're going to get an A in the class. Context is key to understanding this chapter. Next, Paul shares his sorrow for knowing that not all Israelites will be saved. So he's talking about that not all Israelites are, are going to be saved because they're worried about the works. They were sitting there saying that we're the, the elect and as the elect, we're saved, right? And he's like, no, not so fast. That's not what that is talking about here. And so they're going, but I've been circumcised. I've done everything I'm supposed to do. And Paul comes back and says, not so fast. This is not how that works. And so then Paul explains God's sovereignty, verses um, 6 through 29. Sovereignty of God is this. It is the dominant power or supreme authority over us that God is going to do his will no matter what. That is his sovereignty. He will make sure that his will is accomplished no matter what. And I'll explain that in a little bit more in detail. And then you have towards the past, uh, the, the back end of it, Paul shares um, Jewish rejection of Christ. So he is explaining on how the Jew has rejected Christ, which actually plays out even today, that a lot of Jews do not accept the, the Messiah has come and they still practice the ways that was practiced for the most part, practiced um, back in um, um, the New Testament days prior to, they don't have the sacrifices or the temple right now, but they still will talk about there's different ways for them to sacrifice. So anyways, but here's, here's the big idea that I want you guys to know, and this is where I'm just going to touch on a small portion of Romans 9. God's choosing an election in Romans 9, context in Romans 9, is not to eternal life, but to vocation, mission, purpose, and service. Let me say that again. God's choosing an election in Romans 9 is not to eternal life, but 
to vocation, mission, purpose, and service. So let me give you my arguments. First, you have Paul talks about, and understand anytime he makes a statement, he will follow it up with examples or illustrations to make his point clear. So he starts off with the election of Jacob and Esau. Look at verses 10. Not only that, but Rebekah's children were conceived at the same time by our fa father Isaac. Yet before the twins were born and had done anything good or bad, in order that God's purpose in election... Now, wait a minute. This is not electing Jacob and Esau to heaven. And he says it right here. The election here is in order that God's purpose in election might stand, not by works, but by him who calls. She was told the older will serve the younger, just as it is written, Jacob I loved and Esau I hated. Again, the argument is, see, here you go. Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. This is God choosing. He elected Jacob. He didn't elect Esau, so Esau is going to be in hell and Jacob's going to be in heaven. That's not what is going on here. Let's go back to context. Here's a couple things. Who did he elect? He elected both Jacob and Esau. There's two elections here. He elected the older to serve the younger, and he elected the younger to serve the older. So it's not just one election. It's multiple elections that are going on here. So again, this is not an election of salvation. This is an election of, of choosing them to serve God's purpose and will and what he's trying to accomplish. So let's go a little bit further and say, well, it says that he hated Esau. Well, you've got to, and I don't have time to go into a word study on this, but this issue of hate, as we see hate, we see hate a little bit differently than the way it's described in the Greek. See, hate is, is, is more of this relationship issue. You find that in a passage, and I should have pulled it up, but the passage that says, you know, if you're going to love me, you must hate your parents. You go, well, well you know. How many in here would say they hate? No, don't raise your hand on that one. I don't want to know. But we shouldn't hate our parents. We should honor our parents, right? But it uses the same word, hate. And you go, what is that? Well, it's, it's, it's making a contrast of, you better put me first. Even over your family, you better put me first. It doesn't mean that you should hate your family, but you better put me first, okay? And so what he's saying in this context is, I put Jacob over Esau. I put Jacob first versus Esau, because in that time, the firstborn is the one that gets most of everything, okay? The firstborn is, is, is the special child. You know, talk to my mom, and she'll agree, because my brother, who's older than me, was the firstborn. I'm the second, so I get, I get whatever's left over. And so, yeah, exactly. And so... <laughs> I forgot we're recording this, and so dang it, you know, my brother might see this and go, what the heck are you talking about? But, but here's the thing, follow the story out. Jacob goes, he leaves because he, he manipulates the system and he steals the birthright from Esau. He puts the goat hair on his arm. He goes into his father and says, bless me. He says, well, you sound like Jacob, but you smell and feel like Esau. Okay, I'll bless you. And then when Esau finally comes in to get the blessing, he goes, well, I'm sorry. I already gave it to the other guy. I thought that was you. And Esau's like, I'm going to go kill my brother. And so Jacob had to run for his life. And so he goes to his uncle and he stays with his uncle and he finds out he's got this hot looking um, cousin of his and he goes, I want to marry her. And he says, okay, you know, you work seven years and I will give you her. So he works seven years. Next thing you know, wedding night is over with honeymoon. Next day he wakes up and it's not the girl that he thought it was. It was her older sister. And he's like, what in the world did you do to me? And I'm, I'm thinking, how did you not know? You know, I, I just don't understand this one. And he says, well, work for me for seven more years and I'll, I'll give you the younger your sister. And so he does and he gets, so now he has these two wives. And God has blessed through this time, and he has this huge herd of animals, and that's how wealth was um, um, described in the Bible back then. And so he leaves to go back to the promised land now many, many years later, and he hears that Esau is coming. And he goes, okay, Esau's, Esau's coming to kill me because he's still angry at me. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put my favorite wife in the back. I'm going to put my other wife that I'm not so fond of in the front. And so if he starts killing people... He'll kill that wife first before he gets to, I mean, what a wonderful husband this is, right? You know, and so 
But instead, Esau comes, and he's excited to see his brother. And, and, and you know, Jacob bows down to him, and is like, you know what, I want to give you all this cattle and stuff. And he's like, I don't want any of that. Matter of fact, God has blessed me with a lot of stuff. Well, does this sound like a person that's been hated by God? So again, context is important to understand. So that's not what is going on here. It was a matter of election as saying, I elected them for a purpose. And they're fulfilling my purpose for both Jacob and Esau. We don't know. Esau probably could be in heaven. We have no idea. But to use this as an election of salvation is not what this is talking about. Next proof of it. The election of Pharaoh. Verses 17 through 19, look at 17. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, I raise you up for this very purpose, that I might display my power in you, that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Therefore, God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy, and he hardens whom he wants to harden. So now he's sitting there saying, see, he hardened Pharaoh's heart. He, he made it to where Pharaoh, you know, it was already destined for hell, and he hardened his heart so that he could free his people. You go, wait a minute, that's also an election. And it says that he elected Pharaoh for a purpose. And you go, well, yeah, because he hardened his heart. He went, boop, hard is hard. That's not what that means again. Again, if you go in and you study this issue of harden, it's basically like this. God is going to piss off who he's going to piss off. That's what is being said there. Now, let me take it a step further. For you married men in here, I will tell you right now, I know exactly what I could do to tick my wife off. Okay, I know it. There's multiple things I could do to really make her mad. But here's the question. Does my wife have a choice to get mad or not? And the answer is, yeah, she does. But I do know it will make her mad. The same way that God looked at Pharaoh and says, I know what will make Pharaoh mad. I know that what will tick him off. And that's what is being talked about here. He's like, look, I'm going to tick off Pharaoh so that my people can be free. That's the election that was going on. It had nothing to do with salvation whatsoever in this passage. Lastly, the potter and the clay. So he finishes up his examples here with this. Um, look at verse 20. But who are you, a human being, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, Why did you make me like this? Does not the potter have the right to make out of some lump of clay some pottery for special purpose and some for common use? So now you get a better understanding because he's using this potter clay thing and he's not using it as, you know, doesn't God have the right to, to put people in heaven and put people into hell? That's not what he's saying. He's like, doesn't the potter have the right to use some things, as it says here, for special purposes and other things for common use? And so, again, this is, this is Paul describing election, saying, look, we are all elected to do something for God's will. He has chosen us to do something for his will. And as a potter... It's his right to choose what he wants to do with us. Believe it or not, he can choose you to suffer for him. We know this even in the world. There's people all around the world that are suffering for the name of Christ. And you go, that's an election. That God says, I found you worthy and I've chosen you, I've elected you, that you're going to suffer. Okay? See, I, I brought um, th this clay, and I, uh, a couple of days ago, I made this. This, I, I made, this is a common coffee cup, and I made this, and this is common. But out of that same chunk of clay, I also made kind of, I don't know if it's cheesy or not, like a little royal crown, right? But then, after a while, I set it out, and you know what happened to it? I had another, a, a, a piece left over, and I was like, well, wait a minute. What if I change and, and try to put the coffee cup into something else, well, it's now breaking. You know, even, even now, if I pull it here, it's, it's just, it's just going to break. It's, you know, it's, you can't change the form. What changed in that? What, what is absent from that? And I'll tell you, if you, if you ever mold with, with clay, you know if you want to keep it moldable, pliable, you add water. You keep adding water. 
when water is taken out of it, it dries up. The Bible is really clear, you know, that he is the, 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 the water that will, you know, will quench everything, right? And so my encouragement to you is this, that you don't know what God might do with you in the, in the future. You might sit there and say, well, I, I can relate. I feel like God just made me for common use. You know, I don't see I'm making, you know, big impact in the world and in the community, you know, so I must be called for common use. Okay, but you need to stay in the word. You need to be constantly in prayer. You need to honor God in all areas of your life. You need to stay moldable because who knows that maybe he decides, you know what? I'm now going to make you for something special. And where do I get that example? Moses. 80 years of Moses' life, he was common. 80 years, nothing happened in Moses. We read and we understand, but 80 years went by for Moses. And then one day God said, I'm going to take you and I'm going to elect you to go free my people. And Moses said, I'll do it. Now he went a little bit kick, kicking and screaming, but I'll do it. You know, it's interesting. I was talking to our, our um, youth pastor, and we're talking about another person in the Bible that jumps on the pages of the Bible and then is immediately off. And it's a gal named Deborah. And if you go read the story of Deborah, Deborah jumps on the pages real quick because she was, was elected for one purpose only, and that was to kill this king that was being a tyrant. And what does she do? I won't, I, I won't um, you know, go into the details, but basically she takes a tent stake and drives it through his forehead. That's my kind of woman right there, you know, man. She, boom, killed him, right? And we don't hear about Deborah anymore. She's off, you know. But the cool thing is, her name's in the Bible. My name's not in there. Your name won't be in there, right? But her name is because she was being like that chunk of clay. She was being molded. And then finally God says, now I can use you for something special in this one moment. And so you don't know where you, wherever you are in life, you don't know when God might call you, if you feel like that you're not doing anything special, that God might call you to do something special. And you need to be ready and you need to be prepared. But if you're really not walking with the Lord as closely as you should, then you could turn out to be something that he can't use anymore because he's like, look, you know, you've just set yourself and said, this is all I'm going to do. I'll go to church on a Sunday. You know, I'll give a couple bucks in the offering plate, whatever the case may be. But you're really not pursuing a closer relationship with him. And so my challenge to you guys is this. Constantly pursue that relationship with God. Constantly be working on that relationship. And who knows that God might call you to do something very special in your life. Let me close in a word of prayer, and then I'll let you guys um, um, have questions at your table to wrestle through. God, thank you for this time again for me to share, and I just pray that this time for them um, going through these questions will really be a productive time. In your son's name I pray, amen. Thank you, guys.